Welcome back to Building Blocks. This is going to be our second lesson in the series, Building Blocks, Basic Foundational Truth. Our belief system is one block on top of another. In this study, we learn the basic building blocks of our Christian faith. Grasping and growing in these basic points is the key to becoming a more mature believer. As I did last week, this week I want to begin with a few questions. And then at the end of the lesson, we're going to come back to those questions again, and you can use those for conversation. I'm hoping that you're doing this with someone else, uh, but if you're not, the questions are still valuable. Process them, meditate on them, and really apply them to your lives. So for this lesson, our three questions are, do you have an area in your life that you're experiencing self-will? Number two, have you experienced godly sorrow? And number three, what would be the fruit of repentance? So just like we did last week, we're going to talk about the things that these questions apply to and then come back at the end. And so you'll have time to go through those by yourself or with your group. Our key scripture for this study is Hebrews 6, verse 1 and 2. Therefore, leaving the discussion of the elementary principles of Christ, let us go on to perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God, of the doctrine of baptisms, of laying on of hands, of resurrection of the dead, and of eternal judgment. So this is lesson number two in our series. And so we're going to, we're going to be going over the first of the six things that are listed right there in that scripture we just read. The first one is repentance from dead works. This will be the first of the six. In the Greek, the word repentance is metanoia. Metanoia. And it literally means change thinking. In theology, repent means the radical changing of one's mind, a conscious paradigm shift. Literally, repent means to go beyond your present perception or pattern of thinking. In psychology, the word repentance is the process of experiencing a mental breakdown and subsequent positive psychological rebuilding or healing. What a picture. It's like Humpty Dumpty falls off the wall and his pieces are gathered, but when he's put back together, he's better than when he fell off the wall in the first place. This is what biblical repentance is really all about. It's about really a tearing down that happens in our lives, a radical encounter, a shifting of our thinking that puts us back together, but in a better way than we ever were before. I'm listing a bunch of different scriptures for you to go through, and so what I want to encourage you to do is I'm not going to read all of these scriptures. The Bible is packed full of the idea of repentance. That's why it's one of our key uh, doctrines in our belief system. After we've finished, come back, you pause this and go through in your own time and just take a look at each one of these scriptures, meditate on them, study them. But I do want to point out Acts 3.19. That's the second to the last on that list. Acts 3.19 says, Repent therefore and be converted, that our sins may be blotted out so that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. Repentance is refreshing. Repentance, it's turning from the dead works to trusting in God. And so really, when we look at repentance from dead works, which is our first lesson, and faith towards God, which will be next week's lesson, they actually go hand in hand because you're always turning from something towards something else. That radical shift in your thinking, the paradigm shift that takes place, it's a shift from the dead to the life, from going your own way to going a walk of trust. Repentance is the turning that takes place. But first and foremost, you have to turn away from those dead works. And we're going to be talking a lot about that today. Now, also on that list that I just showed you, the last verse on there is Acts 17, 29, and 30. Therefore, since we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone, something shaped by art and man's devising. Truly, these times of ignorance God overlooked, but now commands all men everywhere to repent. Now, right here... Not only do we see the word repent, but we also see a definition from the Bible for what we call dead works. It's these words right here, something shaped by art and man's devising. Something shaped by man's devising. Man was made in the image of God. Therefore, he carries the creativity of God. We were made to be creative. But we were made to be creative in relationship, in partnership with God filled with the Spirit of God. 
So when we are creative without being filled with the Spirit of God, that's when we're producing actually death. Because if we don't have the Spirit, there's no life in what we create. There's nothing wrong with creativity in itself. The wrongness comes when we believe we can create life or a way to life outside of an intimate relationship with our Father God. Life only comes through Jesus Christ and with the Holy Spirit. Therefore, if we are not creating life, what are we creating? Something living and healthy always produces fruit. Genesis 1 verse 12 says, And the earth brought forth grass, the herb that yields seed according to its kind, and the tree that yields fruit, whose seed is in itself according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. Life produces fruit. Then dead works are works that do not produce fruit. There's no life in them. In Luke 13, 5 through 9, Jesus is talking about uh, recent disasters. He's talking to a crowd of people. There's been some disasters recently, which some of us can probably relate to since while I'm making this, we're in the coronavirus scare that's going on all over the world. But certain things are happening. And so the religious people come to him and they say, did, is this happening to them? Did that person die? Did that person suffer because they're a worse sinner, because they're a worse person, or because their parents sinned? And Jesus responds to them with these verses. I tell you no, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. He also spoke this parable. A certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came seeking fruit on it and found none. Then he said to the keeper of his vineyard, Look, for three years I have come seeking fruit on this fig tree and find none. Cut it down. Why does it use up the ground? But he, this is his keeper, but he answered and said to him, Sir, let it alone this year also until I dig around it and fertilize it. And if it bears fruit, well, but if not, after that you can cut it down. We were all created to produce fruit. We were all created to produce from life the fruit of the Spirit. We were made for that. That's our divine destiny. Unfortunately, sin is like a disease that makes us barren, and we can't produce the fruit that we were made to produce. John 15, 5 says, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. As long as we're continuing in an unrepentant life, in a life that hasn't radically changed 180 degrees in our thinking and our operating, as long as we continue on that path, we will never fulfill our created purpose because we're not living connected to the vine, the carrier of life and nourishment. Romans 11, 19 through 20. You will say then, branches were broken off that I might be grafted in. Well said. Because of unbelief, they were broken off. And you stand by faith. Do not be haughty, but fear. By faith, we are grafted into life. We then only continue living and producing fruit as we continue in this faith, this trust relationship with Jesus. Luke 3, 8 says, Therefore bear fruits worthy of repentance. Another way we can say this is when you repent, when you turn 180 degrees in your thinking and in your lifestyle, when you do that radical paradigm shift, you're connecting with the life of Christ and that life is going to be pumping through you and producing a fruit. That is the fruit that's worthy of repentance. It's the fruit that marks repentance. The fact that you have fruit means that you've made that radical shift and connected to life. It means you have repented. Romans 14, 23 says, But he who doubts is condemned if he eats, because he does not eat from faith. For whatever is not from faith is sin. So Romans 14, 23 says, Whatever is not faith is sin. This statement is profound, but it makes perfect sense. The word sin means to miss the mark. Whatever is not done in faith misses the mark. It requires faith to hit the mark. It requires faith to hit that target. It requires faith, a trust relationship, an intimacy with God 
to hit the target. In our previous lesson, if you guys remember, we, we talked about this graphic. Doesn't it look like a target? The target of God is our spirit filled with His spirit. This is our created purpose and the destiny for which we were made. Any attempt at life that does not derive from that relationship is missing the mark. You may be operating in Christian disciplines. You may have, have learned how to control your emotions and keep them in a certain level of order. You may have a doctorate from, of uh, biblical studies from a seminary. Those are all great things. And those all have to do with mind, will, and emotions. Those are soul realm things right there. If you have not connected in the Spirit with the Spirit of God through faith in Jesus Christ, you've missed it. And everything else that you do is missing the mark. Everything else is missing. It's missing the mark. It doesn't matter how good it looks. It doesn't matter how many diplomas you have on your wall. It doesn't matter how many pats you've had on your back. It doesn't ma matter how many followers you have, how many people are packed into a building listening to you speak. None of that matters. It doesn't matter how much money you give away. It doesn't matter how many people you serve the, on the streets or in hospitals, anywhere. None of that matters if it hasn't first connected with the Spirit of God because that's where the life comes from. That's where your destiny begins and resides. Everything else is missing the mark. But if your first target and the source of your disciplines and study are not first and foremost in a living, intimate relationship with the Holy Spirit through Jesus Christ, it's all dead. It's all coming out of that place of trying to make things happen in your own strength because you haven't received the strength that comes from the life of Christ. We receive the Holy Spirit into our spirit. And from our spirit, he flows into our soul, our mind, will, and emotions, and then into our bodies and finally out into the world around us. The only way to experience the spiritual is through the Spirit. The only way to experience life is through the life. The only way that everything we do becomes life-giving is if it derives from the streams of living water. That's the Holy Spirit pouring into our life through Jesus Christ. Life comes from nowhere else and everything else, everything else, everything else, missing the mark. It's all dead works because it has no life in it. It's wasted actions, a facade, a fakeness, a false life, a cheap, cheap, cheap copy. Matthew 7, 13 to 14 says, Enter by the narrow gate. For wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to destruction, and there are many who go in by it, because narrow is the gate, and difficult is the way which leads to life, and there are few who find it. How many of you have tried to shoot a bow or shoot a gun? It's really easy to miss the target, isn't it? The challenge is to hit the target. John 14, 6 says, Jesus said to him, I am the way the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Isaiah 35, 8 says, A highway shall be there, and a road, and it shall be called the highway to holiness. The unclean shall not pass over it, but it shall be for others. Whoever walks on the road, although a fool, shall not go astray. I made this graphic you're looking at because this really lays it out for us in a simple way. Repentance means changing your path so that we step off of the path of destruction, which is very wide. It's everything else besides hitting the target and stepping onto a path of life. That path leads us to the one and only way to life, and that is through Jesus Christ. Once we step through Him, we're immersed in Him. Scripture says that even a fool can't fall off of the path once we've stepped through Jesus. If you're anything like me, that's a pretty huge relief. Why can't we fall off? Because the highway of holiness is a love relationship encompassed in the safety rails of the grace of God. So the path is narrow because there's only one gate. But when you step through the gate, grace makes your way wide and safe. Romans 8, 38 and 39 says, For I am persuaded that neither death 
nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. That is such good news. That is such incredible news for all of us. The moment that we step through the doorway that is Jesus Christ, it's a narrow doorway. It's only one way. It's only one way to hit the target that we are created to hit. And all that stuff around us, all the ways that lead to death seem, seem like there's a whole lot of that. But if we will step on that one path through that one doorway of Jesus Christ, then we step into the huge vastness of grace that is available to us. We step into a love relationship with God that nothing, nothing can separate us from Him. But what is it that motivates the repentance, the turn? 2 Corinthians 7.10 For godly sorrow produces repentance leading to salvation, not to be regretted. But the sorrow of the world produces death. The message version of the scripture says, Distress that drives us to God does that. It turns us around. It gets us back in the way of salvation. We never regret that kind of pain. But those who let distress drive them away from God are full of regrets, end up on a deathbed of regrets. When we talk about godly distress versus worldly distress, really what it comes down to is conviction versus condemnation. Godly sorrow, which is conviction, leads to repentance leads to salvation. Worldly sorrow, condemnation, leads to guilt, leads to death. One leads you closer to God, one leads you further away from God. Psalm 51, 1 through 17, uh, it's a psalm that was written by David right after Nathan the prophet came and confronted him. It was after one of the most terrible situations in David's life, which he'd gotten himself into with his own lust. He, if you remember the story, he lusted for one of his friend's wives and he acted on that lust while his friend was out of town. And then he tried to cover up his adultery by killing his friend. I mean, it's unimaginable to think David, one of our Bible heroes, has done something so terrible. But at the same time, it should be encouraging for us not to do terrible things, but that God's grace is so massive when we respond with godly sorrow. And that's really what this psalm that I'm going to read to you in a moment, it's really a wonderful illustration of godly sorrow and how it leads to true repentance and then leads to salvation. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the multitude of your tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions. And my sin is always before me. Against you, you only, have I sinned and done this evil in your sight, that you may be found just when you speak and blameless when you judge. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin my mother conceived me. Behold, you desire truth in the inward parts, and in the hidden part you make me to know wisdom. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean." Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me hear joy and gladness that the bones you have broken may rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away, away from your presence and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me in your generous spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways, and sinners shall be converted to you. Deliver me from the guilt of bloodshed, O God, the God of my salvation, and my tongue shall sing aloud of your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth shall show forth your praise. For you do not desire sacrifice, or else I would give it. You do not delight in burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. These, O oh God, you will not despise. You know, as I'm reading that, I'm not doing it justice. 
It was written by David in the most broken place when he realized the sin that he'd committed against God, the way that he'd stepped off the tracks in his designed purposes, the way that he had completely missed the mark of God for his life. He felt godly sorrow and turned his life around and put his life back in the hands of God. And God revealed to him salvation and continued blessing with him, continued walking with him in intimacy. There's nothing that you could have done that if you won't turn your life back around and put it back in the hands of your Father and reconnect with the life of God, there's nothing you've done that is so bad that that can't happen in your life. Another great example is the prodigal son. Do you remember that story? It's about uh, a rich man who had a couple sons, and one of the sons went to his father and said, Dad, I want my inheritance. In other words, he's saying, Dad, I wish you were dead, and everything that I'm going to receive when you die, I want it right now. Can you imagine if you have a child, that, per- that child coming up to you and saying, I wish you were dead, I want my money? It's horrible. But that's exactly what the prodigal son did. And so the father, the father gave it to him which is pretty incredible. I wouldn't have done that. You probably wouldn't have done that. But he did. He gave the son everything that he would have received in his inheritance. And the son went out and partied it and blew it and wasted it away. When he gets to the bottom of his proverbial hole, he has an epiphany. It says in verse 17, but when he came to himself, I call this having an aha moment. He had a revelation that he had thoroughly messed up, but that life could be better. It was like a waking up moment. Why am I here? What have I gotten myself into? Then he says in his heart, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you, and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. This is godly sorrow. This is realizing the crimes that, they've, that we've committed, the sins we've committed, the missing the mark that we've done in our lives by our selfish living. This is a, this is a revelation moment. You wake up, you realize you've done wrong, and you realize how much wrong you've suddenly done and how much better your house was with your father. Then he stood up and repented, turning back to his father's house. And he arose and came to his father. This is repentance. What a wonderful picture. He arose and came to his father. He turned around. He changed his life. He, he left where he was and the life he was living and the choices he was making and he went and submitted with a heart that was willing to submit again to his father, he turned around and went home. But when he was still a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. Bring out the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet and bring the fatted calf here and kill it and let us eat and be merry. For this, my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found and they began to be merry. This is salvation. This is our picture of salvation. The son had an aha moment, a revelation of his lack and his father's abundance. Then the son had godly sorrow for the life that he led, the decisions he made, the missing the mark in his life. He realized, you know what? I could hit the mark if I just turned around. And in that moment, his heart had the 180 degree turn. And he went home, and that was the repentance. The father, when he saw him, before he even made it home, the father saw him. He saw his repentance. He saw his turning. He saw his return. And in that moment, the father was the one that ran. And the father ran, and he grabbed him, and he embraced him, and brought him back into intimacy. And he called for his servants to bring the robe, and the ring, and the shoes, all of these things to mark and remind the son and everyone else who this son was. The father completely restored intimacy. And in that moment of restoring intimacy, he completely restored identity. And then along with that symbol of the ring, the ring is a symbol of power and authority. And in that moment, the moment that the son repented and intimacy was restored and identity was restored, influence was also restored. That's a picture of salvation. And it all came from the aha, from the godly sorrow, from the repentance. And the father was there in a moment. It's beautiful. I love this picture. And then the father had a massive party. Who doesn't like a massive party? That's like heaven. Since our conception, we are dead men walking. 
We saw back in Psalm 51.5 that David said, In sin, my mother conceived me. In 1 Kings 8.46, it says, For there is no one who does not sin. All of us are guilty. We are conceived into missing the mark, unfortunately, in this fallen world. But we are all given the opportunity right now in the age of favor that we live in. Right now, we're all given the opportunity to turn and walk in the favor of God again. To come through Jesus Christ back into intimacy with our Father. Back into our true identity, our true destiny, our true influence. We all walk according to selfishness, missing the mark of our destiny. But grace is available. The Satanic Bible's key scripture says, Do as thou wilt. And that not only is a key scripture for the satanic church, but really sums up the heart of the world all around us. The theme is do as thou wilt. Do as you want. Do what makes you feel good. But I'm here to tell you, just like the Bible says over and over again, just like our loving father is calling out, it's not going to hit the mark. You're only going to hit the mark by turning, surrendering, breaking off from your self-will, and submitting to the will of God. In John 8, 44 through 47, Jesus says that we walk according to our earthly father, the devil. John 8, 44 through 47, you are of your father, the devil, and the desires of your father you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources, for he is a liar and the father of it. But because I tell you the truth, you do not believe me. Which of you convicts me of sin? This is Jesus talking. And if I tell the truth, why do you not believe me? He who is of God hears God's words. Therefore, you do not hear because you are not of God. This is why we need to be born again. We need to be born again. We need to be born to the right father. And that's all been provided us, provided for us through Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ crucified is a huge U-turn sign. This is the crux, the bottom line, the crisis of worldviews. Do we see our sin, have godly sorrow and change? Do we continue forward doing as we will? Or do we declare that the life of sin and self-will is dead and buried? Do we accept by faith that Jesus Christ died on the cross for our sins, surrender our will to Him continually, and then by faith cover ourselves in Him, engulf ourselves in Him, soak ourselves in Him, and live as He would live? Galatians 3, 26 and 27 says, For you are all sons of God through faith in Jesus Christ. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Repentance is a complete and radical paradigm shift. It's a total transformation, the birth of a brand new thing, you. It's saying like Jesus said in his prayer, Father, not my will be done, but your will be done. It only works radical. It only works 180 degrees. It only produces fruit, and it's the only way to produce fruit. It's a connection with life. It's a radical difference. There will be visible and there will be a notable difference in your life when you accept the U-turn, when you accept the repentance, when you turn from our own creative designs as human beings and connect with the creative full spirit of God. When we turn around from our self-will and turn our lives over to God and step through the gate that is Jesus Christ. Our questions, again, that I showed you back in the beginning. Number one, do you have an area in your life that you're experiencing self-will? Number two, have you experienced godly sorrow? If you haven't, ask the Lord to reveal to you the ugliness of sin and the beauty of holiness. Also ask the Lord to reveal to you the incredible love He displayed for you on the cross, the suffering, and the punishment that your sin deserved, but He took it all gladly on your behalf to bring you back into the intimate relationship with Him that He had always desired and intended. Number three, what would be the fruit of repentance? Remember, you are not saved by your fruit, your actions. You're saved by entering into the surrendered trust relationship 
with Father God through Jesus Christ. Your actions are the visible result of that relationship. You're saved by being connected to the vine. But when you're connected to the vine, you will produce fruit.